welcome to another day, another nonprofit show. We are here with Sean Kosofsky, um, who's going to be sharing with us a really interesting topic. We are going to be talking about the seven mistakes executive directors make. Um, and this is, we were kind of in our green room chatter going through and sort of reviewing some of these today. And I can tell you, I have made almost every mistake on the list. So I, uh, I think this will be a really interesting topic. I'm curious what everyone else kind of finds of it um, as we go through. So I uh, just want to introduce everybody today. Um, I'm your co-host. My name is Meredith Tarian. And I am one of um, seven co-hosts here at the Nonprofit Show. You may have seen me on yesterday and, and a couple times last week. We have several new faces here at the Nonprofit Show. So we're all just uh, just thrilled to be here and, and working with all of our wonderful guests. Uh, we want to thank our sponsors today. So we wouldn't be here without them. I always like to tell everyone when we started this several years ago, it was intended to be like a one time show. Here we are several years later after COVID um, and we're still going strong and we wouldn't be here without our sponsors. So a special thanks to our sponsors, Bloomerang, Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, 180 Management Group, your part-time controller, Staffing Boutique, JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. So thanks to all of our sponsors. They've, many of them have been with us really since we started the show several years ago. And our real guest today, our, our, you know, the highlight of the show here is Sean Kosofsky. So Sean is the Nonprofit Fixer. Sean, tell us a little bit about your organization and kind of what you do. Yeah, uh, so I've been in nonprofits for over 30 years, and I am a, particularly passionate about executive director leadership. I really do believe that nonprofit executive directors are thrown in the deep end without much support orientation. And they have a board of volunteers that are that are bossing them around. And it's like a very unique role and there's not enough support. So in the 30 years I've been doing work with boards, fundraising, political campaigns, lots of different stuff, I've really kind of honed in on executive director leadership as my favorite. So although I do a lot of things, courses, coaching, consulting, by the end of 2024, I'm going to be moving more and more toward executive director coaching. So that's a kind of like my favorite sweet spot. I have a group coaching program too so it's like uh, my favorite part of the job so 30 years in business with nonprofits, huh yeah that's I got 16 that's a long time i bet you really probably have seen it all then and uh so what you're sharing with us today is kind of like the seven mistakes that you've seen that most nonprofit executive directors make either coming into the role or maybe when they're on the job they're either common mistakes or ones you absolutely can avoid and predict and prevent. Absolutely. Okay, good, good. All right. Well, I'm excited for this for this topic here. Um, I, I love these kinds of topics. I think that the like the the insight from it is so valuable. And like I said, as I was going through the deck today, I was thinking, made that one, made that one, made that one. I mean, I've done them all, right? So um, are you ready, my friend? Let's get started. Sure. All right, so tell us about this first one, not having an employment contract. What what are your thoughts on this one? In the private sector, having an employment contract is like standard, especially if you're an executive. But in the nonprofit sector, what I've found is that most nonprofit leaders do not have them unless you're at like 3 million, 4 million, 5 million or, or larger size budget organizations. So essentially what an employment contract is like a, like a, like a labor union when they win a contract they they have like guaranteed like salary guaranteed position guaranteed hours all of these things for an executive when you get um an employment contract basically what you're saying is we're going to be together for a certain period of time i'm taking myself off the market and i'm committing myself to this place i'm not at will at all and for that privilege of me being here, we want to commit to a certain period of time together. And you don't really want any material change to the job. You don't want a decrease in pay. You don't want anything bad or weird to happen. But you still allow the organization to fire someone. You can still be fired if you uh, if the organization just doesn't want you there anymore. They want to go a different route. But if they fire you without cause, you get severance. And that is so powerful. The ability to say, I've taken my life and I put it into this organization, but now you want to go in a different direction, that's fine. 
you're going to pay me out for a whole year and I'm going to go find some other opportunity. So getting that employment contract is powerful, especially since nonprofit leaders have board members who are volunteers who don't work there. I've seen countless executive directors taken out by a rogue board member or an uninformed board who thinks a tiny thing is a huge infraction. I've seen organizations dissolve the organization, the board doing that. And like the ED is out on their butt, you know, so getting an employment contract protects you, it protects your family, and it has everything everyone focused on the mission instead of constantly worrying about your job. So this one's really interesting because, you know, I I think almost every place that I've ever worked, um, you know, they tend to do at will employment. So this idea of having an employment contract, you know, I don't think most of us ever even, you know, think to ask, right? It's like, you know, you, you oftentimes we sign an offer letter or we sign something that kind of stipulates what the what the, um, you know, terms of the agreement are. But rarely have I come across an actual employment contract. And you're right. It's it's oftentimes at will. Do you ever find that nonprofits are are hesitant or reluctant to do employment contracts? I think people just don't know about them unless you're doing it in executive executive director search firms. They know about these large nonprofits. They know about them. Anyone leaving the private sector for the nonprofit sector, they know about them. So yeah. I do think that I was um, offered a position running a national environmental organization and then the search firm, and they usually get paid once they do a placement, right? So they just want their money. I may have accepted the offer and they just want to get their money and get out of there. But I was moving from New York to San Francisco for the job. And the, the search firm even told me, oh, we don't really do empl employment contracts out here in San Francisco. I'm like, that's garbage. This is the Bay Area, huge tech companies. They all have employment contracts. Just because you don't want to wait for me to, this this contract could fall through at this moment. This is placement, so you're not going to get your money. I'm insisting that I have the protections of a contract. All the other workers might be at will, but I'm not going to be at will. And so I kind of had to push them to get a contract, and I did. Uh, but I think that the search firms certainly know about it. The employers certainly know about it. Our boards are populated with people who come from places where people have these, but we just don't think to, to give this. And it costs the organization zero dollars because they're usually not going to fire someone without cause, right? So it costs them zero to give the, the worker this kind of protection. And they get the, the security of knowing they'll be able to make their mortgage payment or make their rent payment, right? And protect their family. It's a it's a win-win for everyone and it gives people security. Yeah, I think that, you know, you said two things here that I think are really insightful. So the first one being, you know, you, you mentioned the Bay Area. So I'm I'm coming in live today from Tampa, Florida, but I've absolutely moved um, for jobs before, relocated. And, you know, to your point, that's a big commitment, right? So, um, so you know, it's, it's not, I don't think, unreasonable to ask for an employment contract. It doesn't cost the organization anything to do it. The other thing you mentioned is that oftentimes the boards of directors, the boards of trustees in these organizations are, are oftentimes full of folks who are successful and have made their, you know, their wealth and their careers in the for-profit sector. And this is not uncommon um, in the for-profit sector. So it's not something they should be and un, you know unfamiliar with yeah. so I, I, I sell i sell a sample contract on my website too so yes. if folks want to go scoop one up it's done for you i wrote it so it could basically work in all 50 states but you can get it talk to your employment lawyer and be like i want this that's a good tip that is a really good resource all right well let's talk about the next one we have here let's see um number two not reviewing or checking financials before starting the job. This is a really interesting one. What are your thoughts on this one? Well, this happened to me. So I asked, I was offered a position running a women's health organization in North Carolina. I was moving from Detroit to North Carolina. I asked them, how are the books? How is the cash flow? How much money is on hand? How much runway do I have? Right? All good questions. They gave me some really good answers. They even showed me the books. So I did the due diligence that I thought, but it's very um, often if you're an executive director, the board is who's hiring you, right? It's a board or a search firm. The board isn't usually looking at the financials. The executive director is. The board sits around in meetings. They're shown some numbers and some spreadsheets. There, it's a highly unnatural act. Most people can't read financial statements. They claim to, they, you know, but their their eyes gloss over. The board doesn't really know what's going on in the books, and they don't know what, about projections. So the board was giving me these numbers, saying everything was just fine. So I looked at them just to verify. And then in the three month window between my offer and me arriving, they made some decisions to change the way things were financed. And so we, they started hemorrhaging money. 
uh, during that three months I arrived and they had debt they didn't tell me about because I forgot to ask about debt. Um, and then the organization was basically broke. It had $1,000 left. There was a 501c3 and a 501c4, a political arm and a charitable arm. The, the political arm that paid me was basically broke. The charitable arm was fine. But we had to empty out the political action committee. We had to do a bunch of different stuff to fix these holes. But in that window, they made some decisions <laughs> that started hemorrhaging cash. So I really wish in that three month window, I had stayed on top of that, even though I wasn't in the job yet and said, what are you guys doing? Like you're leaving me with a huge problem here when I get there. And I arrived and it was August of 2008. The financial, the economy was collapsing around us on top of this deficit that I found and this hemorrhaging that I found. It was a real nightmare. <laughs> well, that's uh, an unfortunate story, but I can tell you, you know, this is, I absolutely agree with, with your, you know, your point here, which is review the financials of the organization in advance. And, you know, in the nonprofit industry, in the nonprofit sector, we're at an advantage because oftentimes these, you know, financials are all made public. So there's really no excuse for us not reviewing the financials in advance. We have access to audited financials. We have access to the 990. I mean, there's all kinds of resources that we can get in the nonprofit sector where we can we can review these things in advance and you know i think that makes me think of another really important piece here which is you know make sure you know how to interpret or read the financial documents right so it, it, certainly you should assuming you're going into an executive director role but i think it's a really really good point here that you have which is you know it's really critical to check these financials before you get on board mm -hmm. okay let's see number three Okay, what are your thoughts on this one? Not building rapport with the board chair. This is an important topic. Totally agree with you here that this is a you know critical piece. But what are what are what's your experience with this one? The chair is the most powerful person in the organization. Period. Boards own the corporation. Executive directors don't own own the corporation. Boards, under all state law, <clears throat> all states, the board owns the corporation. Um, and the chair is the most powerful person in the bylaws, the most powerful person in the meetings, but they've been elected by their peers to be like they're the most powerful person. What they say and do has a lot to has a lot of control over whether you're going to have a good time there as an executive director. Right. We tend to think of boards as like a nuisance or, well, get off my back, get out of my way, stay in your lane, you know, raise me money, then just don't call me. Like people really do see their boards not as partners, but as like an adversarial thing or a group of people you, you encounter once a month or once a quarter and you have to write this report and you get out and you're like, woo. But really engaging the board as full-on partners, they govern, you execute, it's like it's a partnership, but really building a friendship and a collegial re relationship with the chair is everything. When you want a sabbatical, when you want time off, when you want the organization to cover certain expenses, when you have when you have mistakes, you want that chair going to bat for you, right? So invest, invest. Like it's like you, you almost should remove other things from your agenda. Make your job less stressful to make more room <laughs> to, to protect yourself by investing in time with the chair. Uh, the executive directors that last the longest and have the best job security are those that took the time to build rapport with their chair and their board. Yeah, you know, that is such a good point here. And the other piece about the, the board chair is, you know, the, the executive director, or the CEO of the organization doesn't necessarily have any kind of authority over the board, but your board chair does. So, you know, having, building that rapport, building that partnership with the board chair, I mean, they can work on your behalf to motivate, to engage, you know, to get the folks on the board engaged and bring them in the tent, right? And they can do things that you can't do as the executive director or CEO, and they have that influence over their board members and their peers on the board. So I love this one. I think it's critical and important. I think that, you know, you're absolutely right. It is so important to have a really strong relationship and it should be a priority for folks, particularly as they're coming in new. Presumably our board chairs, you know, have the the institutional knowledge too that you might lack when you come into a new position. Yeah, and I do have a handout. There's like a free tool I have that's a sample executive director board chair meeting agenda. 
So one of the, you never want surprises at board meetings. You want the chair and the ED talking regularly. So I have this, like, this sample agenda. Every other week for one hour, they meet, they talk, they go over the five critical parts, program, finance, fundraising, you know, strategic plan, whatever. And so you've talked things out. So there's no surprises when the meeting comes. That regular check-in is like a great opportunity for rapport, catching up, how are your kids, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but generally I have like a free document that people can get. Um, around that that uh, building that standard agenda, that standard talking points with the board. That I mean, what an incredible resource! And you know, I think you're right. It, it all boils down to you know, transparency is key. And the more you consistently, frequently speak with your you know with your board chair and have these frequent check ins, then it reduces the need to you know to tell everybody everything. Like you said, maybe once a quarter or maybe once a month, depending on the frequency of when your board meets. Mm -hmm. Okay, my friend, let's look at number four. All right, um, executive director mistake number four, keeping or maybe not keeping a success journal. What what do you think about this one? So you have a job description and hopefully you're getting an annual review or regular reviews from your board. Many people are not, but if you are getting that, you'll, you'll have some kind of a evaluation and hopefully a step up in pay or step up a raise, a merit-based or COLA raise, cost of living adjustment. But some, a lot of people are not kind of getting those, right? Um, but at a minimum, if you are adjudicated by your job description at the end of the year, you know, as the CEO of this nonprofit, that you are doing tons of things that are not included in your job description. You are spinning plates. You are putting out fires. You are preventing disaster. Every day that you show up, flip on the coffee and battle injustice, you are doing all sorts of amazing things that are not captured in that job description. So I think that EDs, because you don't have a boss, your bosses aren't there watching your performance every day. You have to write down and log and tell them how awesome you're doing every day. It's like the weirdest thing. So I encourage people to keep a success journal. And this is like a constant log of the things you did. Oh, I nearly averted disaster here. We realized this thing, this isn't in my job description. I just took the initiative and solved this other thing. We almost got acquired by someone or we almost had, we had a board member arrested for something and I put out the fire and made it go away. Like you just got to keep this success journal for all these things. So if you ever get heat from your board about about your performance or doing the bare minimum. They, they just don't know what you're up to. Even if you just keep this private and to yourself, keeping a success journal will just fill you with like empowerment about all the stuff you're getting done. I give this away for free on my website. There's an executive director toolkit. It's a free toolkit with six or seven tools in it. You can go get the success journal for free. Um, and I just, I'm a big believer that people should be doing this. So I love this one because you're right. I mean, we have to advocate for ourselves. And, and you know, when you're at that level in an organization and a nonprofit, you are, you know, you're really at the top, right? So there's not a lot of oversight aside from the oversight you get from your board, right? But those folks are oftentimes volunteers. They're not there in the office with you every day. Um, you know, presuming that you you do the every other week check-in that we just talked about with your executive director, I mean, still, there's there's not a lot of opportunity for them to see the successes that you're making or like the example you gave, you know, hey, I averted this kind of crisis that would have turned into a much larger issue if I hadn't been able to interfere, to step in, to kind of, um, you know, control the situation. So absolutely love this idea. For someone like me who is not great at writing things down, I love it that you have a resource where, you know, we can print it out or download it from your site and it kind of keeps you organized with writing things down, gets you in a good habit of writing things down. This is a really, really good one. I love this idea and I will tell you, I don't think I've ever done it before. Yeah, I literally was doing a consult with a coaching client one day and I was telling her about this and she's like, oh, I have one of these because you told me to. And she opens up and she pulls up this like she kept her own like just journal and she just had pages and pages of all the stuff she was solving. Because if you think about it, executive directors are entrepreneurs. We're making something out of nothing every single day. We're just building the plane as we're flying it. And just it's sort of like a memoir, like a log of all the stuff you put into place. Most EDs, when they leave, they still have a, a positive relationship with the organization. They can come back to that next ED and be like, let me show you where the bodies are buried. Let me tell you about what actually went down in 2013. The success journal is a great snapshot of history, right? 
Uh, so most people don't have this. You can also send voice files to yourself. Just cre create some place where you're like, did this today, did this, some place where you're holding on to your accomplishments in case your review comes back at the end of the year and it's non-stellar. You can say, well, here's the other stuff you weren't seeing. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great idea. I love this one. Uh, you know, this is this is potentially one of the most important ones. And I got to say, like I said, I, I don't I've never done it before myself. So it's a great practice to get into. OK, let's talk about number five. We still have a few left here. Fundraising or understanding your role as the executive director and like presumably your role in fundraising. What it, what are your thoughts? What do you tend to see here that folks make this mistake? Unlike private foundations that give away money, public charities need to raise money. So you are the top fundraiser for your organization if you are the ED. You cannot delegate this. You cannot just like hide. You cannot pretend, oh, I have a development committee and a development director and then wash your hand. No, you are the executive director. That means you are the top fundraiser in the organization. At the end of the day, the bills have to be paid. The board hired an executive to help make fundraising happen. You cannot wholly delegate this. So it's not just because I love fundraising, but it's because everything is possible if you bring in money. But you cannot just say to the board, oh, we didn't hit our goals this year. Our development team really fell down. You can't, you can't like uh, throw other people under the bus. You are the main person holding this thing together, getting the bills paid, running the show. You have to stand in the, uh, the discomfort and sometimes the lack of joy in fundraising and go out there and get that cash. So that means creating the conditions for fundraising success. Creating the conditions for fundraising success, success means hiring the right team, making sure you have the right materials, building relationships, be a thought leader, elevate your reputation in the community. These are all things you need to be doing. Even if your staff tees up the meetings and then you go in and close the deal for the fundraising, you have to be the top fundraiser in the organization. And most EDs just, just they resist this. Yeah. I, this one here, I absolutely agree with everything you're saying here. I couldn't agree more that, you know, this is a mistake I think we see time and time again in the nonprofit industry. I've worked with a number of organizations also kind of in a consultant role, and I tend to see oftentimes that they want to bring in, you know, a, a chief storyteller, or they want to bring in somebody, a figurehead that is more, is really representative of maybe their, their demographic or really representative of the beneficiaries of their services. But you are absolutely right. I mean, at the end of the day, what we're talking about here is you are the chief fundraiser. I mean, that is your role. That is your job. And uh, it's important that they bring folks in that understand that, that recognize that, that have the, you know, the background and skills to do and to fill that role. And if they don't, most importantly, that they're coachable. And so love this idea. Um, couldn't agree with you more. I think this is so far, Sean, as we're going through this, this is my, this one is my top one. So let's see what the last two hold. Okay. Not firing bad employees. This one's really interesting. I got a lot of thoughts here, but let me hear yours first. Some people say you got to hire slow, but fire fast. I totally agree. I have been I have been guilty of letting someone linger on the team that should go. So one of the reasons why I left being an ED after like being an ED five times is that toward the end of it, after COVID, one of the things that brought me just crushing, just like sadness was having to do another search. Whenever someone leaves the organization, having to run another search, it just, I don't get to do the work. I don't get to do anything. I'm now distracted by another search. I've always worked in really small nonprofits, less than 15 staff. So I'm usually involved in the search and just like pouring over job descriptions and people's resumes is just, it just kills me. So we tend to resist firing someone because it's so disruptive, right? But at the end of the day, we are hired not to be liked. We like to be liked. All managers like to be liked but we are hired to get results. Our board, our stakeholders, the people we serve, whether it's like starving kids or like people in, our, in the pews, like they, they hire us to get results, to mission attainment. And anyone who is not helping you get to your mission needs to go, right? Mediocre employees, low performing employees, they need to go. It doesn't mean you just fire anyone for just being mediocre, but it does mean that you either need to develop them or if they're not a good fit, you need to move them out. You can coach them into a consultancy, coach them into a different role, get them on the board. But Basically, if you have a bad employee, and I'm talking about performance issues, or they're just not cutting it, or they're phoning it in, you need to get rid of them. And there's an easy way to do it. I can literally demonstrate to you. Hi, 
today's your last day. This is what the, this is why you're being terminated, and you're gonna get your benefits pat you know cashed out to you at the end of the month. Do you have any questions for me? It is that easy, right? But we're we're, we're so a, a conflict avoidance or. Um, fearful of having these difficult conversations that we just don't want to have a performance review question uh, conversation or a termination question. The management center has sample firing scripts that you can go download for like a sample hiring script, a sample firing script. But we need to move out people who are not helping us get to our mission. The mission is too important to let people sitting around who aren't a good fit. Anyone who's had a good hire knows the difference between a bad hire and a good hire. And I've resisted at times moving someone out because it was just too disruptive. And at the end of the day, once a, a better person came in, I was like, why was I waiting so long? So this is one of those tough topics. And, you know, you're right from a business standpoint. And I think in the nonprofit industry, sometimes we forget that we are running businesses, right? This is a business. And so, you know, it's not personal um, if you don't have people in the right roles and, you know, hey, maybe they're even, you know, good employees, they're good people that, you know, we'd love to, to spend time with and even have as our friends and our coworkers, our neighbors, but maybe we just don't have the right roles or right positions on our team. And if that's the case, you, you know, you're right with every with every day that passes, you know, we're losing money, we're losing time, we're losing resources and talk about a bad employee that has an effect on, you know, the, the you know, um, company morale or team morale, I mean, that can be far more detrimental than keeping them on, on your staff or then get, I'm sorry, than getting rid of them or getting them off of your staff. So this is, this is one of those tough topics, but it's critical. It's necessary. It's something that again, will make you, um, and your whole organization and your mission you know, more effective. Okay. Let's talk about this last one here. So, uh, the last one on our list saying yes too often, this is one of those, this is a mistake that I don't think is, is, um, saved just for executive directors. I mean, I feel like we all do this to some extent in our various roles throughout the nonprofit organization, even board members sometimes. So what do you, what are your thoughts on this one? We are people pleasers. Many of us are. We oh sure you want me to join your coalition. What will it look like if I don't if I if I don't participate? I'll look like I'm not collaborative. Okay, I'll join your coalition, but then you can't really participate fully because you're so busy. We say yes to things because we want to be liked. We say yes to things because we want to be perceived as collaborative. Employees pushing work back up to us. If you're an executive director, you need to push the work down. It's like, you know, I tell my employees, don't bring me problems, bring me solutions. By the time you've spotted a problem, find one or two solutions, bring me a recommendation. Don't bring me problems. I have hired you to solve problems, right? But we keep taking the work back. We keep saying, yes, okay, I'll just refix this. I'll just proof this. I'll do do more document review. We keep saying yes to all sorts of things. We need to get everything off our plate. Executive directors have to have time to think. We are constantly doing email, email, meeting, meeting, just brushing through 100 tasks. We need blocks of time in our schedule to think that we are hired to be strategists. We are hired to be decision makers. And you can't make clear decisions if you're constantly in meetings and doing document review and emails. So you say no to more stuff. And it's OK to say we're only going to do three things well here instead of 20 things poorly. Right. Yeah. We're going to do less. I'm going to say no to things. I'm going to not going to say yes so often so that I can have the time and the space and the mental health break to give me a couple hours to think about this new board member coming on, to think about whether this offer should go to this employee, to think about our strategic development. Right. You need that time. And once you have it, you're like, I'm never giving this up. But you can only <laughs> get that time on your schedule. I do no meeting Mondays. I don't have any meetings on Mondays, period. It is a godsend to have a Monday where you can just get through all your work and you feel like the whole week you're caught up on day one. So I don't do meetings on Mondays. I do them Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. I also am a big fan of the four-day work week and put compressing all of it into four days. But this means saying no to a bunch of stuff. We have to protect ourselves, our sanity, and our longevity so we don't burn out. Say no to more things. We can't be all things to all people. Yep, this is, um, you are like music to my ears. You're speaking my language here, right? Because I, I fall mistake to this one all the time saying yes, especially on small to staffs, right? We feel like we have to take it all. We have to do it all. Delegating is key, particularly when you're an executive director, right? I mean, you, you have to have, this goes hand in hand with the last one we just talked about, which is having the right people on your team and being able to delegate to them. So absolutely agree with you here. Um, all of these were so critical, so important. 
Couldn't agree with you more. I'm curious what everyone else thinks. We had Sean Kosofsky with us today sharing all of these seven mistakes that executive directors tend to make. And um, and it's I, I think I know I've made all of them. I'm going to I have a few takeaways from today. I'm going to start keeping a success journal. I'm certainly going to going to try to start saying no to things more because that's one that I have a hard time doing. I think a lot of us do. You can visit Sean's website here, nonprofitfixer.com. He shared with us a number of resources that he has available right there on his website that we have access to. So make sure you stop by and see his website. Sean had so enjoyed having you today. This was absolutely fascinating, this conversation. Um, I, I have so many takeaways from it. So really enjoyed your, your input here. Oh, thank you. We want to. It's been a delight. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. We hope to have you back again on the show because I bet we could come up with another seven mistakes, right? That we that, <laughs> oh, these yeah. aren't the only ones, right? Yeah. So that being said, we want to thank our sponsors again as we close out. We wouldn't be here without you. Bloomerang Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, 180 Management Group, Your Part Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, JMT Consulting and nonprofit tech talk. So we appreciate all of our sponsors and all of you who joined us today from all over the country or even all over the world watching the broadcast. And we'd like to sign out every nonprofit show with the same sign out, the same saying, which is stay well so you can do well. Thanks, Sean.